Okay, so we're looking at this issue of why high temperatures might be needed for the helium two lines. This is not core to this module really, but um, allows you to uh, apply a little bit of a uh, little bit more physics. <clears throat> so then, hopefully familiar with this idea. It's kind of sort of Rydberg formula for hydrogen really, but the idea that the energy levels are proportional to one over n is squared. But for hydrogen-like ions, uh, you've also got the how many what's the charge of the nucleus effectively so ha huh, so for hydrogen that's one obviously uh, but for helium uh, so for helium the helium 2 ion then this number is four okay. so that means that the um, you know, energy levels for he he the helium 2 ion have the same pattern as for hydrogen but the energy levels are four times deeper okay. so if we have a and sort of look, this is the helium-2 uh, energy level diagram. So it looks very similar to the hydrogen one, uh, but this time it goes down to you know, 50, minus 54 electron volts. So that's four times the 13.6 that we had for N equals one in hydrogen. So this is the N equals one for helium, and this is the N equals two. Okay. Uh, so the equivalent series of lines would need you know, mostly uh, four times uh, more energy. Um, no, it's not. So that tells you why you need, you know, the higher uh, temperatures. Uh, higher temperatures give you higher energy. So to uh, populate this level, uh, you're going to need a lot of energy. Uh, in fact, it's worse than that because the optical lines uh, are actually coming from here. So the uh, n equals three to four. Okay, the difference here is, you know, a couple of electron volts, which is similar to that for the Balma series. So this is, these are the lines that actually appear in the optical. Um, so they need uh, even more energy uh, to excite them. Okay, so that explains why you need higher temperatures uh, for the helium two lines. Okay, well, let's get back to this idea that if you take the spectrum of a star and look at the pattern of lines in it, uh, it's giving us a very detailed insight into the temperature of the photosphere of that star. Um, so basically, um, stellar spectra, um, a classification sequence uh, you know, arose for stellar spectra. Uh, and eventually this became a temperature sequence. Okay. So early on, sort of, you know, early 1900s, um, then you know, larger telescopes have been built um, and the photographic plates were being used as detectors and spectrographs had been built to take the spectra of large numbers of stars. It was a major industry at the time. And so huge numbers of spectra of stars were being, uh, photographic spectra were being collected and they were basically you know, like any new science, um, then they were, they were just classified according to the patterns that were seen. Now, of course, you know, around 1910s, something like that, this is 10, 20 years before quantum theory of physics had been developed uh, and understanding what these spectrum meant uh, in terms of the physics was, was not there at all. Okay. So, um, that sort of explains a little bit as to why this sequence appears a bit like an arbitrary jumble of numbers and letters. Um, but let's just go through this for now and then I'll, um, I'll explain the sort of little bit of history behind it. So um, basically, um, as you'll have seen hinted at on those previous diagrams, um, a quantity called spectral type can be a can be assigned to any particular star, okay? Uh, and it basically, it's just given one of these letters. So O, B, A, F, G, K, and N, okay? And this is basically a temperature sequence, okay? So uh, this is the hot end, so stars with an O spectral type, as, the, as you would say, uh, are the hottest stars and stars with an M spectral type are the coolest in terms of their uh, photospheric temperature, uh, effective temperature, okay? Now, uh, 
in this module. I'm not going to ask you to remember this sequence or, or really learn it in any shape or form, really. Um, yeah, if, you, if you like this kind of astronomy and you want to remember it, there are various uh, mnemonics uh, that have been developed uh, in order to remember the sequence. Uh, the, the most famous one is uh, O B A fine uh, girl or guy uh, kiss me. Uh, that, so that's the, if you want to remember the sequence, then that's the way to do it. One way to do it. Um, like I said, uh, you know you don't need to know or learn the sequence for for this module. So the key thing is that it's a temperature sequence. Okay. So going from this end to this end. Um, another little bit of notation that you might hear or see in textbooks um, is that uh, these are referred to as early type, they're sort of early in the sequence, I guess, uh, and the, the cool ones are referred to as late type. So you, you, you hear the phrase uh, early type star or late type star. So again, it's just another way of saying hot or cool. Okay. And the reason the, the sequence is kind of jumbled up like this now uh, is because, uh, as we shall see, then uh, the A-type stars are the ones that actually have the strongest Baumol lines. So the Baumol line was a very clearly recognizable uh, set of lines in these early spectra. And so the ones that came in with that simple recognizable pattern uh, were given the initial class of A. And then uh, ones with slightly weaker Baumol lines were given B, okay. Uh, and initially, you know, C, D, E, F, G, uh, uh, and all that sequence, uh, in fact, up to P uh, were given. Um, but, you know, 10, 20 years later, when the, I, the quantum physics came along and people started understanding the, the, the various uh, species responsible for the spectra, uh, it was then realized that it was actually a temperature sequence. Okay. Uh, and so, the original just alphabetical classification, which started with strong Baumol lines and went towards uh, weaker ones, uh, plus lots of other different lines, as you should see, that that was thrown away. Um, but the, the labeling with these letters was not thrown away. So lots of the classes, you know, you can see that C, D and E were junked uh, and merged. Um, and so we ended up with just, just this uh, set of letters now. Okay, so it's a historical sort of hangover, but again, it's like a lot of things in astronomy, it, it's very ingrained uh, and people, you know, if you find a new star, uh, people will immediately say, okay, well, what spectral type is it? With meaning, you know, which of these temperature categories does it fall in? Um, so just a little insight, more insight into that uh, uh, historical origins. Uh, all of this early work actually was done at Harvard uh, 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 in the US, uh, and all of this classification work in the, in the Harvard Library was actually done by women. Uh, and so you can see the, uh, the ladies of uh, Harvard College Observatory Library uh, busy here. You can see all these photographic spectra, okay, uh, and they're very organized, classifying everything uh, uh, into, the, into one of those uh, classifications. And, um, and uh, so, you know, all of this fantastic work that was done uh, that laid the foundations for sort of uh, modern uh, spectral classification of stars was all was all done uh, mostly by these uh, uh, women in the in the Harvard system at the time. Uh, with one bloke looking on, looking a bit of a spare part in the background here. Um, I think the uh, the blokes were mostly up all night using the telescopes, uh, collecting the spectra, uh, smoking their pipes, etc. Um, but the uh, the women were here uh, doing the doing the detailed work of, of classifying these spectra. And, you know, these are the kind of patterns uh, that they were looking for. So this is a sort of modern sort of colorified montage of the different spectral types. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, you can see there's a temperature sequence here. So going from the hot stars at 35,000 down to order of magnitude cooler at 3,500. Um, and over here, we see this uh, spectral sequence of letters, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Okay. And let's just focus in on our example line again, the, the H alpha line. Okay. And we can see exactly the same pattern in these 
photographic spectra of different temperature stars, as we saw in that graph of line strength versus temperature earlier. So at the cool, uh, the very cool stars here, you can see, you can, in fact, you can hardly see the H-alpha line at all. Okay, it's very, very weak. Again, that's because these stars are so cool that the uh, hydrogen is in the uh, ground state mostly. But as the temperature uh, increases, you can see the line getting stronger and stronger. And then around about uh, 10,000 Kelvin, the line is at its strongest. You can see it's very deep and dark here. Okay. Once you go past that temperature, the hydrogen is being ionized and the H alpha line starts to decrease again. Okay. And you can see that here, at this particular uh, spectral type of A naught, we'll come to the figures in a moment, but this is the, the A type stars are where the Balmer lines are at their strongest. Okay. So it's true for H alpha here. Here's the H beta line over here. So you can see the same thing here. Okay. Um, it's a bit difficult to see the, the helium two lines there. They're too faint in the hot stars here, but they are there. Okay. Um, so you've got, um, other lines to point out on here that come in for cool stars. Here's quite a famous uh, spectral line, the sodium uh, sodium lines. So this is from uh, atomic sodium. Now you can see it's extremely strong. This sodium line down here is, is stronger than the H alpha up here. But again, as I said before, that does not mean that these sort of cool M type stars are made of sodium. It's just that sodium is extremely uh, good at interacting with optical light, uh, this particular transition. Um, so actually, we are familiar with this uh, transition from everyday life. This is the um, if you uh, not so common these days, but uh, street lights uh, that haven't been replaced. Sort of the older version of street lights always had that orange glow about them, and that's because they were street lights that were full of sodium vapor, and so the street lights were emitting at this particular orange wavelength here, which is why uh, old old-fashioned street lights were always always orange. Okay. But here, of course, we're seeing this line in absorption, not, not in emission. Okay. Um, down at this cool end, you start to see some pretty weird looking things as well. You see these funny looking sawtooth type patterns almost. Uh, these are actually due to molecules, okay. but uh, not, not really common molecules that we would uh, recognize. This is a molecule of titanium oxide. Okay. But again, um, you know, the abundance of certainly titanium is extremely low in stars, but titanium oxide is extremely efficient at, at absorbing optical radiation at these frequencies. And so uh, that's why you get these funny patterns. Uh, so, so at cool stars, you can have molecules floating around in their atmosphere. Um, as you go to very hot stars, then you obviously, you know, a lot of things are getting very ionized. But this is the, the pictorial patterns that were classified and underlie this, this spectral sequence, which was then later worked out to be a temperature sequence. So that's a photographic representation of it. Here you can see a graphical representation of the same thing. Uh, so here you can see the H alpha line, okay. Uh, going down through this way. Okay, here's H beta again. So you can see in the A stars here, the Balma sequence of lines is extremely strong. It's obvious that this is the, the Balma series here. Um, see the lines getting closer and closer together here, exactly as I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. Okay, so that's your Balma series there. Uh, as you go to hot stars, you can start to see helium lines coming in. As we go to these very cool stars, here's the sodium line. And here are these funny triangular looking sawtooth patterns of molecules. Okay, these are the very coolest stars down at around 3000 Kelvin. Okay, so that's the the patterns in the spectra and the idea that um, it is a temperature sequence. So yeah, so just come back a little bit more detail on that. So as well as the letters, you've got numbers. Um, and so <clears throat> each uh, subclass like, like the A stars is divided into uh, up to 10 uh, numerical subclasses. So you've got A0, A1, A2, etc. until you get up uh, to the F stars, and then you start again with F0, F1, F2. Uh, so just to give you some orientation, uh, the sun has a spectral type of, of G2. Okay. And 
the Bama lines are strongest at A0, so that defined, that's a bit like your zero point for spectral classification, you always start from there. Um, and A0 stars have an effective temperature of around about 10,000 Kelvin, so, so another one we've met in a sense already, uh, the star Vega is an A0 star. Okay. So that's its spectral type. So if we go back to here, here you can see a G2 star. So this is very similar to the uh, spectrum of the, of the sun. Okay. okay, so let's summarize all of this. So the absorption lines in stellar spectra can be used as a classification system for stars. Okay. So it's a very uh, sort of fundamental underpinning. Um, you get a new spectrum, uh, you start to compare it to sort of standard uh, stars in the classification sequence and you can classify your, your new stellar spectrum. And as we shall see, then that can really start to tell you an awful lot about the star already. But the key thing it tells you is a measure of its effective temperature. Okay. So that whole pattern of spectral lines is primarily determined by the effective temperature of the star. So that's the key point of this lecture. So this gives us a really accurate way of measuring effective temperature. It's better than just looking at lambda max with Bean's displacement law, and it's better than looking at B minus B uh, with the color. Uh, but of course, to do this, you need a very high quality, high, dis high resolution spectrum. So you have to disperse your light. Uh, so that means you need a lot more sensitivity in your telescope to get the spectrum, okay? Because you're spreading all your photons out over a large range of wavelengths. So it's harder work to get a spectrum, but if you can do it, then you're going to get a lot more accurate information. Okay, so I'll leave you with another uh, thing to ponder. Well, it's not a calculation, so it's just something to think about uh, at the end of this lecture. So if you go back and look at the uh, spectra of the A-type stars, there was a big drop in their continuum level just below 360 nanometers. Uh, I'll just take you back to see that. Okay, so here you can see the... Uh, spectrum of the A-type stars. And so the continuum looks like it was going to carry on up here. Okay. But boom, here at 360 nanometers, it drops down. Okay. So, you know, you can see that there's a clue here. You've got the Balmer series sort of uh, converging to some sort of point here. Um, you might want to think back to the uh, first class example we had in this. Uh, lecture as well uh, to, to have a think about that. Okay. So basically, you know, why is the continuum level dropped? What, you know, it looks like something has absorbed that continuum. So what, what's it doing? What, where's that continuum gone? Where's that energy gone? Okay, so that's something to think about. Okay, so we'll uh, see you next time.